Okay, let's open our Bibles now to Hebrews chapter 8. I believe that's page 1200 in your Pew Bible. We're going to read uh, verse 7 through 13. And that will take us to the end of the chapter. Chapter 8, verse 7 through 13. For if that first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. For finding fault with him, he says, The whole days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. But they did not continue in my covenant, and I did not care for them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, the Lord, I will put my, says the Lord, I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And they shall not teach everyone his fellow citizen and everyone his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all will know me, from the least to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their iniquities, and I will remember their sins no more. When he said a new covenant, he made the first obsolete. But whatever is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to disappear. Let's take a moment to pray. Lord, we... Uh, lift up this time, ask that you work in our lives and teach us, Lord, the truths of, of the book of Hebrews. As we have more than halfway, Lord, continue to speak to us the, the, all of the truths that you have in this chapter and the chapters of the whole letter as we reach this climax of your great revelation found in Hebrews. We pray, God, that you work in our lives and very real ways, Lord, speak to us in the hearing of your word and bring to mind all that you want your truth to apply to. Lord, let us think on and meditate on your word. And Lord, I live by it. Your word is a light to our feet. Guide us, Lord, and teach us how we pray. Amen. We uh, are looking at this chapter and uh, seeing so far another uh, motif develop through the superiority of Christ, which is overarching of the book. We've come to chapter 8 where we see the, the superiority of place in the first half of this chapter, which we looked at last Sunday. Jesus is in a better place. Uh, and we're seeing here a better covenant in this uh, second hand, which we're going to talk about today. So, so wonderful how Hebrews uses these, these terms and it really fleshes it out. What is better? What is superior? Who doesn't want something that's better? Who doesn't want something that's superior? And another term that we see pop up over and over, a key term here is new. This is a new covenant. Uh, it's better and superior. It's new. Who doesn't like new things? Anyone, anyone here like new things? We, I think we all like new things. I mean, don't we like a new dress, a new pair of shoes, a, a new car, a new home? Who wouldn't want some of, some of these things that are new? I mean, who could, who, who could use a new fill in the blank? Tell me, what could you use new? A new yarn. A new yarn? Yarn? <laughs> okay. New yarn. What else? We could use a new something. Awakening. A new awakening, okay. We just got a new refrigerator. A new refrigerator? We just got a new dishwasher. That's right, we need it. We definitely could have used a new one months ago. <laughs> uh, we love new things. I mean, rarely do we want to keep one of the old ones. Maybe if it's classic, vintage is in, 
It's got its place, right? But we love new. We'll always go for new. And so that's exciting. I mean, there's this concept of new and exciting. Now, what's the problem with new in our lives? That's right. It breaks down eventually. It's not new anymore, right? It loses its shine. It loses its luster. Uh, you know, it, the fridge is new for a while. The dishwasher, the car. Uh, it's amazing how quickly and old things get. But the interesting thing about what's new here is it's not only new, but it's eternally new. This covenant is eternally new. And that's mentioned in chapter 13, verse 20. Uh, now the God of peace who brought up from the dead the great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the eternal covenant even Jesus, our Lord. So, this covenant that we have, what a, what a beautiful picture by right? what God started and what he did, he continues and it is eternal. And it's an eternal covenant. Always new. Uh, there's two covenants. There's the old and the new. The old covenant started back in Genesis 3.21 and continued all the way to the cross. It, it was new for a while, but we got old. We got very old. And God had in mind a coming covenant that is new. It is. It started at the cross, and it never ends. It's eternal. Always be there. Always new. So uh, this idea that um, Jesus is this new high priest who worships in a new place, a better place, and is mediated for us this new covenant. Uh, God loves us so much. Do you know that? Do you know God loves you? How does God show us that he loves us? How do you know God loves you? How has he demonstrated that? Through the work of his son on the cross? When we think about that, and we just have, we've been unpacking, you know, the role of Jesus in our salvation and his mediation, think and reflect on the kind of love that God has shown us. He came to save us. And we talked about he saved us from the fear of death, he saved us from, from ourselves and our bondage to sin. But the love of God for him to send Jesus to rescue us, the rescue plan that, Jesus, that God had for us. Remember, uh, Last week, we talked about uh, uh, the, the, uh, the cave rescue, right? Those 13 people were rescued. Two of those uh, people that went in, the divers died. They gave their lives to rescue. I don't know if you saw this week, uh, the, uh, on the news, some quirky, funny, sad news is a beluga whale found its way from the ocean, swam in the Seine River, and made it into Paris. A smaller whale made it into the Seine River. I don't know how you pronounce it, the Seine, Seine River. And it was in the Paris city limits. It got stuck there. They went in to rescue it. It didn't belong there. They needed to get back in the ocean. Well, in the rescue, it died. There are all kinds of rescues. Sometimes, all, with all the best intention and equipment and investing and that, uh, to try to rescue that whale, he, the victim died. In the other instance, uh, members who went in to rescue rescued those 13 boys, but those who went in died. The rescue plan that God had for us, and the amazing thing of how he loves us, is he he put no risk on us being rescued. He said, all, all of this will go on my son. He will die to rescue you. There will be no risk to you if you turn to my son, Jesus Christ. You will be saved. And so that's how we know God loves us. And we see that the old covenant required blood to be shed. So the new covenant requires blood to be shed. And so Jesus, we looked at this uh, 
uh, last week, he offered, uh, verse 3, every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. So it is necessary that this high priest also had something to offer. What did he offer? Well, he laid down his life for our sin. So he offered up himself. And this new covenant requires that offering. So he is uh, the one who has issued this covenant, and it is by his blood. Uh, God, God's desire to rescue us, to draw us to him, uh, by giving us his son, Jesus Christ, is all over the pages of Hebrews up until now. And we've seen this. Uh, come before him now. Come before him. And hopefully we have that desire to come before God. And hopefully we see the superiority of everything offered through the Son of Jesus Christ. We, we see in verse 7, it says, For if the first covenant had been faultless, there would have been no occasion sought for a second. Why have a new covenant if the old covenant was good enough? Why draw to God in this new way through Christ if you can draw through God in the old way? So uh, there's a lot of questioning of this new way. Uh, and we see Paul here saying, if you want to compare priests, let's compare them. If you want to compare sacrifices, let's compare them. If you want to co compare covenants, let's compare them. This new covenant by this new priest far is far better and superior. We see here that there is fault with the old covenant. For the covenant, first covenant had been faultless. There have been no occasions sought for a second. And that is uh, uh, there translated in the original in passive, infinitive passive, in per perpetuity. There was, even when there was this old covenant, there was always this seeking of a better place, the actual translation of this better uh, place for a second covenant. The finding fault with them, he says, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. So, <clears throat> the old covenant, it was perfect in its showing the people, the old covenant, the old law, showing the standards of God. This is a holy God and this is his holy law. And his covenant is a, is a promise that he will always keep. And it was perfect in that sense. It was also per per perfect in being a, a placeholder, showing and pointing people to Christ. But how was it, it says here, that there was fault in it? And twice that word is repeated, verse 7 and 8. If covenant had been false, I mean, implying it was, they had fault. And, and in verse 8 it says, for finding fault. What was the fault of this covenant? Uh, fault is that it could not bind these people to whom the covenant was given to God. It could not free them from their sin. This is the problem with this old covenant. A covenant here, uh, very interesting, is made up of two two words here, and the uh, the first half of that word means actually place, and the second means to. A covenant is, uh, is an agreement between two parties. It is a spoken word uh, between the place of two people. So God always kept his covenant, of the also New Testament, or promise, his word, word given. God always kept his word and his covenant. God always kept his promise. But uh, the covenant wasn't always withheld. The covenant uh, wasn't always, there was fault to be found because people were not using the covenant to draw near to God. And we're still over and over in sin, which, which these verses repeat. You see in, um, in uh, verse 9, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day, this is speaking of the old one, 
on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt, for they did not continue in my covenant. You see that? Covenant's given. It's a holy covenant. It's perfect. What's its problem? It was a father. It was a continuum. That covenant was not binding equal to God. It was made to bind, but it didn't bind. It was made to show a way, hold the, hold the covenant, keep to the covenant, you'll be free from sin. But people were still in sin. They weren't keeping the covenant. So we have this new covenant we have. We can draw near to God through Christ, but only through Christ. Only through the new covenant. Is your heart set on and desiring to draw near to God? The throne room is open. The throne room of grace is there. Access to his mercy, access to his salvation is there. Do you desire it? You want to draw near to God. You enter uh, through the new covenant, through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. People all over this world today and seeking answers and seeking truth. In, in their lostness, uh, if they don't know Jesus Christ. In their sincerity to find meaning, in their sincerity to find a way to God, will do anything. Oftentimes crazy things, won't they? In their, in their desire to draw near to God. We have been given this covenant. We have been shown how to draw near to God. That should mo motivate us, excite us. And we know the way to God and how to draw near to Him. And that's through His Son, Jesus Christ. The whole purpose of what we saw last week, that, that uh, Jesus is in a superior place, mediating, was compared to the tabernacle. The tabernacle we saw in verse 5. When God gave it to Moses, He said, he said, this is a, sh a shadow, a copy of the heavenly things. I will dwell with you in this tabernacle. This is, uh, but this is just a copy of, uh, uh, just a taste of what's in heaven, of what dwelling with me looks like, of what drawing near to me looks like. Draw to me near to me in this tabernacle through the law, through the holy covenant, through the sacrifice. Uh, there were four courts that people could enter. The courts of it was, of course, divided up for men, for women, for the priests, and for the Gentiles. You, you were in one of these circles when you were drawn near to God. We talked about how you had to bring your sacrifice to the priest, and the priest would do it for you. And this is the way you drew near to God, in the old way. And even the priest could only come one day a year at the Holy Holies. One day a year. And yet we see that this high priest uh, uh, is at the right hand of God. A priest could only come one day a year, let alone be like Jesus Christ, who is sitting down and dwelling forever uh, in heaven. And we see this said in verse 5, that this, this old way, this tabernacle way, it says that uh, it was given to Moses and God warns that it is to be this tabernacle. See to it that you make all things according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. So the purpose of the tabernacle was in the old covenant was a way to find uh, for given for people to draw near to God and to be with Him. But in the in the new covenant, we can draw directly. He is our priest. We don't need to worry about which courtyard, where we stand. We can go right into the throne room. Did you know in Revelation 21? Uh, would, would you turn to me with me to Revelation 21? I want to show you something very interesting. I'm kind of. Okay, I, I'm kind of wondering if I should go straight to the punchline or lead you into it. Let me lead you into it. Uh, look at verse 9. John is here and angels have come to him and they're talking. It says in verse 9, the one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me. This is John. Saying, come here. I will show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great high mountain 
and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like a very costly stone, as a stone crystal clear jasper. So he's showing him the holy city, this new Jerusalem, this new place. This is what heaven is going to be like. And, and he's showing, and here's describing all these seeds. It had a, verse 12, it had a great and high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels. And names were written on them, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. There were three gates on the east and three gates on the north, three gates on the south, three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones, and all of them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. The one who spoke with me had a golden measuring rod to measure the city and the gate and its gates and its walls. The city is laid out as a square, and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles, its length and width and height were equal. And he measured its walls, 72 yards, according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold, like clear glass. The foundation stones of the city wall were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the third Chalcedony, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh chrysolite, eighth beryl, ninth topaz, tenth chrysoprase, the eleventh jacinth, the twelfth amethyst. And the, and the twelve gates were twelve pearls. And each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. Now, there it is, the nuts and bolts of heaven, the, the stone, the measurements, the gates, streets of gold, and all of it is described. Now listen to this next verse. Verse 22, And I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb are its temple. So that tabernacle, that desire for God to create some meeting space was created, given to Moses, and now we see there is no more temple, for God is there to, to be with us. Isn't that extraordinary? And, um, and so we see the purpose of drawing near to God that starts here, that will continue, and we will be, there will be no more need for a temple with him, worshiping him. This, uh, this uh, comparison to this better covenant, it, it, there, there was fault in it. And in the covenant, you have three things, okay? You have the parties, uh, you have God, you have man, and you have what? The promises, right? So look how he does this. He slightly does this. He changes the emphasis of where is this fault ultimately? Okay, we kind of we kind of highlighted there is fault in the covenant, but ultimately, where does it go with this? Look, if you look at a fault from covenant, you see um, in uh, verse seven there's fault with covenant. In eight, where does the fault go to? Fault with them. It's fault with them. It's a problem with us. There's a problem with us in how we relate to God and are free from sin. And you see here that um, this quote here, behold, days are coming. So Paul's saying, okay, if you, if you don't believe me about the new covenant, let's turn to the scriptures of the old covenant and let's look at the old prophet Jeremiah. And he's quoting Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, these next verses. He's saying, if you have a problem with what I'm saying, look at Jeremiah. You have got a problem with him? So very interestingly, in Jeremiah 31, 31, which is the same quote here. Behold, days are coming, says the Lord, when I will effect the new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Here that the lineage is Israel uh, was in the north, Judah was in the south. The whole house is as if it's with the people of Israel, right? This new covenant, which is found in Jeremiah 31, Verse 31. 
Uh, Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, the house of Judah. Same uh, exact wordage. This is interesting here. You see this word here in verse 8 of chapter 8. When I will, what does is, what is your translation say? When I will blank a new covenant. What does it say? What do you have there? I'm hard of hearing. Effect. Very good. If your uh, if your translation says make, it's not make. It's effect. It is effect. And when you look at uh, Jeremiah 31, 31, uh, the Hebrew here is hard to translate. Behold, days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. There he, he made this covenant. But the translation here is one of the most difficult that I have ever come across. Very difficult, very complicated to translate. Uh, the word is we karate, we karate. What do you think that means? Karate, where we get our word karate from. To cut down, to, to, to cut, to slash. And so this, this old covenant was very uh, difficult uh, to, to keep. And even, even as it's being described here for the old or for the... The new, the old covenant had its symbol of um, uh, circumcision, right? The actual symbolic uh, sign of the covenant was that cutting and was the shedding of blood. Uh, the cutting here continues uh, the sacrifice and the shedding of blood in Jesus Christ. But there was this covenant made and the problem was that uh, the people weren't keeping it. So the fault really is with them, with the people. And here we see very interestingly, the word here is translated, not make a new covenant, but effect. God says, I'm going to have this new covenant and the effect of this new covenant, will, it will change your heart. It will change the way that you, your heart is towards me towards sin. Your heart will be for godly things and for fleeing from sin. So uh, it, it says in verse 9, it's not going to be like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand. Now think think about this, this, this covenant that ultimately the fault is not in God and that it's in the other party, in man. It's not in the promises. It's in in the, the carrying out by the people. If I made a, a testament, covenant, or promise with, with uh, Elliot, and I said, Elliot, we're making a pact. You do everything I say. You obey me. You follow all my rules. I will never spank you. I will bless you. Uh, I will reward you. I'll take care of you. And uh, on and on. If I made that kind of pact, he couldn't keep it, could he? He couldn't keep it. Uh, I may still be good and, and on my end of the bargain, still bless him, still forgive him, still maybe skip a spanking every once in a while, uh, still reward him, you know, for you know, in other ways. Uh, but he he couldn't keep that, could he? Because of there's fault in him as that second party. He likes to pull a ponytail every once in a while. He likes to pull a punch every once in a while. Who doesn't? <laughs> right? Uh, he, he's not going to always be good. So, so you see that covenant promise that God made in the way that it's uh, very much like my relationship with uh, me and Elliot. It's not far off from what's being described in verse 9. It, where Paul says here, not like the covenant which I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand. That has literal uh, connotations of parent and child. God had to, you know, like God had to treat Israel like a minor. 
had to literally, you know, always be on their case, had to walk with them by the hand. And they were disobedient, and they were rebellious, they were stubborn, and God had to, to discipline them. And he says, he, uh, they did not continue in my covenant. And, very interestingly, it says, I did not care for them, says the Lord. The Lord got tired of it. And so he's not going to make a new covenant just like the old covenant. He's tired of uh, what happened. And so even in Jeremiah's day, he, prof he, he told Jeremiah to prophesy, I foresee a new covenant. There's coming a day when I will effect a new covenant. And, and it will change their hearts and minds of the people. Those people who draw near to me through my son. So this was all already prophesied. For this covenant I will make with the house of Israel after those days, says Lord. Very interestingly, both covenants are made with the house of Israel. Both times God is saying, He's not giving up on these people. And we are, very, we are, there's many passages in the New Testament, Romans and, uh, and uh, Galatians and Ephesians, where we see we are also as Gentiles, able to partake of this covenant through Christ. But uh, God is not giving up on these people. His heart is for, for these people to change. So I will put my laws into their minds, and I will write them on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. There shall be no need for us to be teaching anyone anymore to know about the Lord, because they will all know the Lord. That's God's desire. And we see that heavenly picture of Revelation. And my desire is there will be no more temple. There will be no more need. They will all know me. They will all worship me. We will all be together. In that, in, What a beautiful picture of intimacy and closeness to God. Uh, <clears throat> that we have. So 1 Corinthians 3.16 tells us, Do you not know that you are a temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you? For the believer now... God resides in us. That closeness is found in His Spirit dwelling in us. He tabernacles in, is in us. And, uh, and that continues on when we one day be in heaven. So the effect of the new covenant, it's, it's a better covenant. And you, and you can see the effect for those who have turned to Christ. Let's pray. Would you join me in prayer? Lord, we see that uh, if it weren't for a new covenant, our minds and hearts are no different than those who turned against you in the old covenant who rebelled. We thank you for providing a new way, a way that will continue forever, that we be close to you and that we be free from sin, that we have hearts changed, minds changed, renewed to desire you that the effect of the new covenant found from Jesus Christ so that we, be, we become mature in faith, not childish, not rebelling, so that uh, we be able to live it out, all that you intended, that you would be uh, known by all those who turn to your son Jesus for all of us to know you in, in such an intimate, personal way. For all of us to not only just understand salvation when we first turn to you and ask for forgiveness, turn to the cross, but to live, in, live out the salvation that you planned for us, the work that you would start in our lives now that would continue forever. We thank you that... Uh, you provided this new way and that we can uh, count on your covenant, count on your promises. And you're so good. You've been so faithful. And you, we thank you that you help us in faith walk through your Son Jesus Christ in faithful ways, being led and guided every day for a new life that you want to provide for us. And we thank you that all these promises really are spiritual, really are eternal. 
really are to continue in the next life for us. So help us not to look for things of this world and be distracted by the things of this world, but focus on the promises. Focus on the saving work that you started and that wanting to continue in our lives each and every day. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's for our hot dog next.